Hello everybody, welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having a great day. As always, a free way to support the channel is by leaving a like, by leaving a comment, or by subscribing if you have not already done so. It does indeed help with the algorithm. Welcome back to another News I Missed, where I go over News I Missed, because there's always a lot of stuff happening in the cryptocurrency space, so I bring it to you in these videos. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. Co-founder of Ethereum and founder of the full stack blockchain company known as Consensus. His name is Joseph Lubin, has given his take on the future of Ethereum. Lubin has stated that there are signs that a demand surge is likely to push the price of Ethereum upwards after the London hard fork goes live on the main net. Speaking in an interview with CNBC... Lubin explained the reason for his faith is because it's his project. He pointed out that Ethereum, like other Ethereum upgrades geared towards transitioning to Ethereum 2.0, the London hard fork, which is set to go live, I think the 4th of August, brings several improvements to the network. Among the improvements, he considers the most significant one to be the fact that Ethereum will become deflationary with upgrade EIP1559, noting how... This is a good thing for the network. Lubin states that the issuance of new tokens on the network has before this time been inflationary, logical, but with the upgrade, miners will no longer receive new currency for verifying and adding transactions to the blockchain. The transaction fees will rather be burnt by the network, thereby reducing the supply of Ether in the long run. We are so close. I cannot wait till this finally happens. This has been spoken about, discussed about for a very long time. A lot of people, now no one knows the future, no one knows what's going to happen, but a lot of people are giving their Ethereum price predictions as to where they think the price is going to go after the uh, upgrade happens. The craziest one I think I've seen was 30-something thousand. A friend of mine thinks that we are going to try and mimic uh, 2017 Bitcoin's price, i.e. You know, everyone's saying 10,000, but we'll probably hit 20,000. I'm aiming anywhere between eight to ten thousand dollars personally myself. I think that is a a more than reasonable number that we can definitely hit. Um, a lot of news around Ethereum, a lot of news around banks liking Ethereum, getting into Ethereum, offering Ethereum, Ethereum futures, Ethereum ETFs are also being proposed now as well. So uh, we finally, nearly two weeks left, reached the point where. Uh, if you want Ethereum, the only way that you're going to, you know, as the, as the as the upgrades continue, that you'll be able to get it is by holding Ether yourself, and then we'll see exactly what effect uh, the deflation and coin burn. Because I assume for the first three weeks, it's going to be everywhere, like exactly how many coins were burned that day compared to how many were actually created, and that will definitely have an effect on the price. And yeah, let's move on. Next up. In news that shouldn't surprise anyone, but this is also quite popular news, Binance US, the US-based version of Binance, is looking to go public despite the ongoing regulatory crackdown on Binance. Now understand, I, I, I think people for some reason get this wrong or don't really understand what's taking place. Have you ever seen before when a bank does something terrible, I mean, look at 2008, 2009, where the entire system collapses? Uh, the usual thing that has to happen is that they have to pay a fine for what they did. I'm not talking about crashing the world economy and having to pay a fine. But in Binance's case, uh, they're just missing paperwork and actually missing physical locations. Like Binance does not have a, a place you can walk into. And this is basically what regulators want. A lot of times people assume... There was an, uh, there was an article from about two days ago... Uh, where this guy was like staying, stating how shocked he was that people were still using Binance despite all the regulatory backlash. And it's like, yeah, because they just have, like, it's it's not that Binance is going to disappear or crumble and go away. Uh, what's going to end up happening is they're going to have to open up physical locations and they'll probably have to pay a fine to regulators. That's it. Like, there's no real... It's kind of the same exact thing uh, with with Ripple, XRP, and the SEC. Like, Ripple is still a company that exists everywhere around the world except for the United States. And I think only three countries right now have a problem with Binance. 
I'm just trying to throw some logic your way because I keep seeing people saying all these things and like, I mean, like, sh how well, people are still using Binance? Like, Binance isn't closed. They just have to, ha like, literally, they, they are not closed because they don't have an actual physical location. Anyway, Chung Peng Cao, founder and CEO of the global exchange Binance, talked about its ongoing regulatory issues and future plans at the Blockchain Virtual Summit Redefine. Wow. On the what? Carver says, "Okay, this this article says he talked past tense about the ongoing regulatory issues at the event tomorrow on Friday. That's why I was confused. The CEO expressed confidence that Binance Binance is set to face heavy regulations in the future, noting that the company is in the mindset of shifting from a tech startup to a financial service." Sal reiterated that Binance has been aggressively increasing its compliance efforts, including hiring former regulators. The CEO admitted that the company's efforts to cooperate with regulators have not been the firm's strong suit, pointing out the urgent need to localize compliance communications. But despite seeing a meager success in communicating with global... Because the, a lot of regulators are also jerks. Like the, the, These people are usually just flexing their muscles to try and make sure that they, that they let other people know that they have power in certain jurisdictions. And this is what makes them really upset because Binance doesn't have a physical location. Like You can have a problem with them in Indonesia, but who, who are you going to call? Who are you going to talk to? You, you, you have to take time out of your day to figure out what this man's email address is to email his people. You can't simply barge in and walk into a place, which is what uh, regulators have been doing around the world for the last like four years in the cryptocurrency space. They go in, hand them a whole bunch of paperwork, but who do you hand paperwork to when they don't have a physical location? This is why they're having a problem, because they're used to the world still being like the 1930s, even though everyone has a smartphone and we're on the internet. You're watching me right now from a wireless device. I, I bet. The world is in the future, but regulators are still very far in the past. But despite seeing a meager success in communicating with regulators, uh, it doesn't preclude that possibility that Binance will one day go public as the exchange is seeking ways to go for an IPO. He said Binance US is looking at the IPO route. Most regulators are familiar with a certain pattern or having headquarters, having corporate structure, but we are setting up those structures to make it easier for an IPO to happen. So... I, I don't think that Chang Peng Tsao would have ever mentioned that Binance is looking to go public. Uh, if he couldn't, yeah, you understand what I'm saying? Like these things are going to happen. Every single thing in the cryptocurrency space is going to be public or listed on the stock exchange at some point. Uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. This was also quite popular news because I'm not sure why people in the crypto space get so... Remember, what was that other crypto exchange that... that oh gosh, what was it? Bitmex? 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 Bitmex. I think it was Bitmex. Uh, last year or the year before, who had like regulatory trouble, and people were like, well, they're, they're done for. No, they just have to pay a fine. Like, if if all these companies, not Binance, but like the banks and the institutions who have done terrible things over the last 10, 15, 20, 35 years, actually had to leave and close down shop because they did something terrible, we would have no business on this planet right now. Anyway, that's the Binance is clearly going to go public at some point. Who's this woman? All right. Let's move on. Next up, Milan headquartered Italian luxury fashion house Dalsi & Gabbana is launching its debut non-fungible token collection called Collezione Genesi, which is inspired by the city of Venice. With the help of UNXD, a Polygon-powered digital marketplace. According to Vogue, the items from Collezioni Genesi will be featured in three DNG events. Alta Modi, Alta Sartoria, and Alta Giolieria. I don't speak Italian. Collections taking place in Venice on the 28th of August, the 29th of August, and the 30th of August. They should just said the 20th to the 30th. Collezioni Genesi will be available for sale on the UNXD website on the 1st of September. As Anna Tong reported for Vogue Business on the 5th of April, fashion brands have been studying the wild, wacky world of blockchain and all its creative and business possibilities and are now poised to jump in. Uh, there's no actual word on exactly what Dolce & Gabbana is going to be creating, except for the fact that they're making NFTs. I don't know if they're making NFT clothing or cologne so i guess the news is is that 
fashion brands. And you know, the really crazy part is that this is actually going to take off. And, I, and I'll tell you exactly why. Remember last year before the like the whole NFT popularity, you know, explosion thing ended up happening. We had news that Nike was also thinking of creating their own NFTs. And the NFTs were basically going to be digital representations of the shoes that you could buy inside the store. And people lost their minds. People were trying to like sell these things out the moment that they actually got announced. And this, once again, this is before the actual hype. So if we end up getting into a situation where these luxury brands are like releasing digital versions of their clothing. Have you ever been to like a, not a clothing museum, what do you even call them? Like a, I don't know, like some type of a history museum. There, 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 there are a lot of them in major cities where like they have an entire wing dedicated to like clothing from kings and queens and other royalty and things that people wore at this time and what people look like in the 1800s and things like that. If they end up doing this correctly, we're at some point by the time our kids are our age going to have museums where people go to see like digital representations of the clothing that Dolce & Gabbana l launched in like the 60s and 70s. And even more so, even crazier, is if you walk around the museum with like a headset or maybe not with a headset, maybe just sit in your living room with a headset on. I'm thinking very far in the future. And basically you can wear this clothing as well or like go to an event with the digital clothing. That, that would be crazy. If there was like a game that was like Ready Player One, where basically you could buy this luxury clothing, digital versions of it, and when you're inside of this digital world, you could use that clothing to go to events inside of, all right, I think I just figured it out. Anyway, that's the Dolce & Gabbana news. Uh, none of you were expecting Dolce & Gabbana NFTs. I sure wasn't, but alas, here we are. And without further ado, let's move on. Next up, a group of Paraguayan lawmakers presented a Bitcoin bill in the National Congress last week, but it turned out to be a very different proposal than what crypto followers had expected. The bill seeks to control and regulate cryptocurrency transactions and establish taxes. There is no mention of declaring Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency as legal tender anywhere in the proposal. People are shocked that a government wants control. I mean, I've never seen it happen before, but here we are. The long-hyped Bitcoin bill was at last presented in Paraguay to the National Congress by two lawmakers last week, but it was not what some had anticipated. The project presented by Deputy Carlos Rejala and the liberal Senator Fernando Silva Facetti, fancy name, doesn't aim to declare Bitcoin as legal tender, as El Salvador did last month. In fact, it states the opposite in early draft says... Digital assets are not legal tender currencies used by the Paraguayan state, and for this reason, they are not backed by the Central Bank of Paraguay. That all makes sense. It's not legal tender because they didn't create it, they want control over it, and this is why they're making taxes. Where's the, where's the problem? Did, did people expect every single government to completely fall over themselves? No. These people, of course, these people still want control over their own money. Do you think, first of all, that's why the El Salvador thing was so significant. Because this guy stepped out of his shell and was like, wait, maybe the money that we make isn't the best one? That's why it's significant. So don't expect every other, like, don't forget that there are tons of politicians who don't care about their people. Not saying that you allowing Bitcoin as legal tender is caring about your people, but if you know that there's a better way, we, we would have a perfect US dollar backed by actual gold if people really cared. Like we've known since 1971 that the system was going to collapse. Now we're seeing the collapse. Has anyone cared for the last 50 years? No. Anyway, instead, the proposed law seeks to regulate crypto transactions for the state to collect taxes for trading and other use cases. The law proposes the Central Bank of Paraguay as the comptroller of all entities related to cryptocurrencies. Facetti would, when consulted about the direction of the proposed law, stated, This is not a legal tender. This is a commodity. And the purpose of the law is to regulate and control the industry. They're a government. What did you think they were going to do? This is the base project that we have today. Fantastic. So the news is um, government trying to control stuff. Anybody surprised? No. The the really important part always is that it's not banned. That is what we should be looking for. Uh, there's a huge difference between adopting it as legal tender 
uh, and also saying, hey, no one on this dirt pile can use it. So they're regulating it, same as every other country. And that's the news. Yeah. Let's move on. In this, no, should not, I don't understand why this is actually happening. The cryptocurrency community is highly anticipating the release of a new documentary. That is a lie. Why would you write a lie in your article? About the Ethereum blockchain with the film's funding campaign exceeding expectations. A crowdfunding round for the Ethereum-themed documentary called Ethereum, The Infinite Garden, uh huh, has surpassed its goal of 750 Ether, raising a total of 1,000... What? What? Ah, they, they raised 1,000 Ether, worth $1.9 million as of Friday. And then they announced, we did it, y'all. We, we, we raised all the money to make this movie. The funding campaign started on Wednesday to support the production of a feature-length, character-driven documentary film exploring the innovative real-world applications of the Ethereum blockchain. The diehard community of enthusiasts and developers and its creator, Vitalik Buterin. Have you ever seen, um, I think there were two of them, uh, movies about uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, him, oh gosh, it, 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 it was him and someone else. And basically, as they had these movies coming out about them, you know, like five, six, seven, whatever years ago, uh, they had interviews and they were like, I was hoping that no one would have ever made a documentary about me while I was alive, or like a movie about me. I'm sure Vitalik is feeling the exact same way, because I have a feeling Vitalik won't be starring in this, but they'll ha <laughs> they're going to hire someone to play Vitalik. And you ever have one of those situations, like, you always wonder, like, if there was a movie about my life, who would play me? Because if they choose somebody ugly, you're going to be like, do I... Do I look like that? Or if somebody like too attractive, you're like, dude, that doesn't look like me at all. So the point is, yeah, there's an Ethereum movie documentary called Ethereum, the Infinite Garden. That name, man, it's 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 a lot. Um, We'll see what happens. They raised one point nine million dollars. It's not, you know, a Hollywood budget, but I think they'll be able to get it together. I think this is releasing. Oh, boy. Where is it? Winter 2023. Oh, boy. So, yeah. I mean, listen, at that point, I, I I think the really interesting part is that by that point, we should have a 10, 15, 20, 35 thousand dollar Ethereum if, it, if the deflation has continued. So it's either going to be like a movie like, wow, look at how far we've come. Or Cardano is going to be coin number two and everyone's going to be like, oh, <laughs> bad timing. Anyway, that's the awkward news. Like, why would you? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, that's the Ethereum, the the Infinite Garden. You know how many? Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's move on. All right. All right. All right. Next up, the number of institutional investors, wealth managers, foundations, and so on that own crypto assets has grown dramatically and will continue to do so in the future. This is according to a new survey from Fidelity. According to the survey. 70% of institutional investors intend to buy or invest in digital assets in the near future, with 90% of them planning to do so by 2026. I hope, I hope it takes them to 20. Can you imagine knowing that Bitcoin is a thing, knowing that cryptocurrency exists right now and has the potential to rise a lot higher in like a six to one year month period, but you don't plan on buying in until 2026? Further context. That's one, two, three, four, five, five, seven. Okay, let's say it's 2016 and you sit there and you go, I think we'll buy Bitcoin in 2021. See how weird that sounds? Because remember how cheap Bitcoin and everything else was in 2016? So when I read that earlier, I, I, I kind of smiled because these are the people who bring us to a million dollar Bitcoin because they end up fighting each other over, you know, fractions of Bitcoin at that point because this will be another having, and just 2026? While the crypto industry churns out optimistic surveys on a regular basis, the Fidelity findings are worth noting given the company's size and influence in the broader financial markets. The findings are also a bit of a bright news for in the industry at a time when markets have been mired by months-long slumps. 
it's not that bad. Prices are okay, especially if you're here for the long term, especially because we were three thousand dollars last year. Anyway, so this is now it's Fidelity, it's J.P. Morgan Chase, it was BNY Mellon, Morgan Stanley, and somebody else who recently announced uh, that institution. No, no, it was it was. Oh gosh, what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Oh no, no, it's the the largest bank in Switzerland. ABC one two three. What are they called? It sounds like ABC. A N N. All right, whatever. They recently announced as well that huge amounts of institutional investors, very rich and wealthy clients, are either into crypto or looking to get into crypto because they have a huge amount of FOMO, which is logical because the cryptocurrency space continues growing with or without you. That's why when the Paraguay law came out like a couple of days ago. I was like, oh no, we we didn't have them in the market before and we were doing just fine. So, you know, them regulating it and getting taxes for it isn't going to make us feel bad. Anyway, that's the more rich people plan on getting in. Please, I, I please, 2026 would be absolutely wonderful because I, I can't wait for the news. Can't wait for the news on all these different letter channels talking about that this company is just getting into the space and they spent like 4.5 million dollars and they got like 1.2 bitcoins cannot wait for it really excited for it anyway that's fidelity let's move on next up bitstamp a bitcoin exchange based in luxembourg has announced the launch of tether's first euro backed stable coin known as ert that is E-U-R-T. Tether issue stablecoins already hold a dominant position in the European crypto sphere. And with the rising demand for stablecoins, Yurt could be the answer to exceptional profit margins for Bitstamp. The press release has stated that the launch is... What? Dated the launch the 22nd of July, Thursday, and it states... What? That the coin will be available for trading on both on the website, Bitstamp, and Bitstamp app. Cool. Bitstamp mentioned that Yurt... It's custom made for users in the European territory because it's in it's it's, it's euro. Uh, the exchange highlighted that the low risk relative stable coins are mostly traded against the US dollar on a one to one basis. Nevertheless, Yurt will be compatible with euro users, allowing them to trade in their domestic currency. So Tether has a Tether coin? Tether made a Tether. Tether made a euro based stable coin. It was like coin inception or something what is is this backed by tether like i mean like not tether the company like is it backed by tether like the, the actual cryptocurrency all right anyway so tether made yurt and i'm sure a lot of people are going to be using it and that was also popular news because tether's been in the news a lot lately we have a lot of uh runarounds for uh stable coins a lot of people like them a lot people are using them and they're usually seen i, I think is like a like a what is it they indicate when the market appears to be going higher or will go higher because more of them are being created because of demand. So cool. Can't wait to not use this, but other people will use it. So good luck to them. And to finish things off, the Shiba Inu subreddit community of Rashiba Army has hit a new milestone in terms of subscribers by exceeding 200,000 peoples. The remarkable growth of the Rashiba army was identified by the team at Shiba Token through the following tweet. They say, congratulations, Rashiba, for your 200,000 friends. A quick glance at the subreddit stats reveals that the Rashiba army, I know it's not Rashiba, has now 201,000 members. Additionally, subscribers to the subreddit community have grown at a rapid pace since mid-April, as highlighted in the chart below, courtesy of the tracking website. Cool. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, Shiba Inu's in the news. It's really weird. Shiba Inu's in the news more than Dogecoin is or was. We never hear too much about uh, Dogecoin anymore. The last news we had about Dogecoin was Coinbase Commerce. You can now buy stuff in Dogecoin. But Shiba Inu is, is just as popular. It's, it's constantly getting tons of people. I assume we'll have news by Christmas that this number is now half a million people. Uh, yeah. Has anyone else been seeing tons of Shiba Inus outside? Or is it just me? Like, and, and I, this is not a joke. About three, two, two months ago, when Shiba Inu was like just becoming like a really popular topic coin, 
I keep seeing like every fifth person walking around with a dog now has a Shiba Inu. So I'm, I'm just kind of really inquisitive as to if everyone else has seen them outside as well, or am I just the only one? Because, you know, it's kind of uh, weird that, that I'm seeing them everywhere. Yeah, anyway, yeah. All righty. I do hope that you... That is what the... Somebody just sent $1.2 million worth of Bitcoin. Holy... 30s, holy freaking guacamole. Wow. All right. Big spender. I do hope you all enjoy. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Hope you all are having a great day. A great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope that it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all. I'm looking on the side now, waiting to see like if there's gonna be any other big transactions. It's really weird because sometimes you see some of the transactions happening and you just, you know, kind of not 132,000 is also like a huge amount of money to be sending. I wish I said that, like the transaction fee next to it, but I'm pretty sure it's like twelve dollars or whatever Bitcoin transaction fees are right now. Do hope you, half a million dollars. Do hope you all enjoy. Do hope you all are having a great day, great morning, great afternoon, or great evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope that it is absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching and or listening. And I, <laughs> if you see my eyes, thank you all once again for watching and or listening. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.